of that nature um, with the uh, once a month Zoom as well. Uh, but again, those of you who are members, uh, thank you, welcome. A couple of housekeeping things on the camera club front. Um, two things, uh, we had the opportunity over the last couple of weeks to photograph dogs for the community hospice. Um, they put together a calendar of their therapy dogs. Um, we had an opportunity to help out last year and we're doing it again this year. So I know Renee helped out on that as well and Kay. Uh, I don't think anybody else here worked on that, but we had seven different members come out to the beach and to the fort, um, run over to Mandarin um, and, and really give some, some good love back to the community. Um, so thank you, thank you Renee. Um, big news for us is the member show. So the member show is coming up a week from Friday at the St. Augustine Art Association. Uh, we had 45 of our members submitted 120 photos. Um, they're fantastic. I think people use their COVID time to get some really good photos. Um, but we're looking forward to that. 48 of them will be on display. Uh, if you have a photo in that, uh, in that show, uh, is it the 31st that, that we need to have the entries? Yeah. Between 12 and 5. Wednesday or Thursday of next that week. It's two days. Two days. Two days. Yeah. Okay, Wednesday and Thursday. Of, is that next week? Next week. Next so week. Today, so if you haven't gotten it printed, you better get moving. Here we go. And if you need help with that, you need suggestions on a printer, CK, she, she can point you in the right direction. 12 to 5 on Wednesday and Thursday of next week? Uh, it is oh, Tuesday, Wednesday. The 31st is 12 to 5, and then the 1st is 10 to 1. It's Tuesday on Okay, and if you don't remember that, all that is it's on the website. Week, it's the following week. It's the following week. Yes. Next yes, week. it's the following week. Okay. Next week is the 22nd through the 27th, and then the week after is okay. the 29th. A little longer than that. Like that. The 29th, yeah. okay. Yeah. And then the actual show itself is the 2nd. Is that correct? It's a Friday. Start the Friday for third. 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 <laughs> okay. Again, it's written down somewhere. Um, but that's five days. The awards are at seven. Big money. Big money awards. Um, anything else? Um, next month, uh, we'll be in this location again. Uh, we have Mark Smith. He's a fantastic bird photographer. Um, he has pictures of an osprey catching a fish that has a crab hanging on <laughs> in great detail you know um, so he's he's really fantastic we're lucky to have him coming up um, there's no zoom meeting next month um, we when we have a uh, we do the second Tuesday of the month is zoom and the third Thursday of the month is a live meeting if they fall in the same week we cancel the zoom um, with that also uh, Kathy Canary is always gathering pictures for our library exhibits, if you're interested in that and you haven't talked to her, go see her. Um, she'll usually collect every month to, to hang things for display for you. Uh, lastly, yes. Additional to that, um, we are trying to take the pictures down at the Watson Beach office okay. and put new ones up. Mm -hmm. We had talked about this a month ago. Yeah. And um, I have a list of everybody that has picture hanging okay. right now. Um, there's a handful of people that have multiple images hanging. Okay. And um, could I say their names actually? Yeah, yeah, sure. All right. So everybody on this list, if you can come and get a piece of paper from me, it, it says what you actually have showing there because you probably don't remember. Um, and then we'd like to have something replace what is there with the same size it has to be an image of St. Augustine. If you don't want to replace and don't want to hang anything at all, then I would need to know so that we can put it out to everybody else. Um, I just found out Ruth McAllister is moving. So there's a spot for his space, which is eight by 10. Um, so anyway, so there's Rick McAllister, C.C. Taylor, Michelle Mallard, Linda Skinner, Terry Bottom, Kathy Canary, Kay Wells, Linda Burrick, and Adelette Kegley. So if you're here, come see me afterwards. And, and some of you probably heard this before, but as I understand it, it's the Watson Realty Office. Um, the realtors are encouraged when they sell a home to offer a gift, and occasionally they'll take those photos off the wall if you have a price on it. Um, you 
pictures, so it's an opportunity for you to sell those pictures. The office actually bought Art Hughes' photos that he had hanging on the wall. Oh, awesome. And so, okay. And, and yes. In case. Yeah, and Kay sold one to one of the agents, and Kathy also sold one. And Kathy sold one. Okay. You know, so not that it's big sales, but you never know. Yeah. You know, it's a great telephone gift. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kathy? There's one on here from Michelle Mallard. Um, I'm just trying to contact her about the one that I held on to for a year now. Actually, more than a year. Um, so there's also an 8x10 metal that is going to give, be given up um, that space if you're interested. Okay. You know, if you've got something that'll fit right into St. Augustine, that's great. Those pictures are awesome. Okay, can we get that maybe in, in the newsletter? Right. Um, also along that line, so the next Guy Harvey exhibit, I think everybody knows there's an exhibit right out there, um, that's St. Augustine in black and white, so Terry's looking for submissions to that, um, you know, print two, you know, one for there and one for Watson maybe. Um, anything else? All right, so uh, I guess it's been about six months since uh, uh, Mike volunteered to talk to us a little bit about his photography and his experiences. And I, I've been really excited for the, this to come because, you know, we get a lot of folks that are real technical, you know, hey, dial the f-stop to this or dial the shutter speed to this. And, um, you know, so we, we haven't had as many people talk about the experiences they had when taking those photographs. Um, and certainly haven't had somebody um, <clears throat> with the breadth of experience uh, and take those photographs. So. I'm happy to have Mike, um, and uh, about halfway through, I think we're going to have a, a prize drawing, and uh, at the end, open it up for questions. But yeah, Mike, uh, floor is yours, and uh, we'll go from there. Good to attend. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm going to remain seated. You can see over me then, and I won't stand in the way. Um, just, just to start, uh, my photography started uh, years ago. I had my own architectural practice in historic preservation for over 32 years in St. Charles, Illinois. And uh, I'm going to show you, uh, especially the photographers in the group, uh, of course we're talking Slava Ukraini, uh, glory to Ukraine, we'll talk about that, but I wanted to show what I used actually in my Peace Corps travels for five years. Uh, I used the uh, D5000 digital camera, uh, Nikon with a couple lenses. And uh, I got to tell you, and Michael was right, that uh, I don't get as technical. If you were here at last month's uh, meeting, it was over my head technical. I put my camera on automatic and shoot. Uh, when I did, I did go out to uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming for three years to work on their Capitol building, and uh, I shot a couple rodeos, and I had to redo my whole uh, settings because uh, I needed to shoot a lot faster. Um, I had about a thousandth of a second instead of 200, uh, one 200. But th these are the, the lenses I, I used in my travels. Uh, previously, I shot with a view camera, 4x5 sheet film, and a 2 and a quarter camera, on the RV67. Uh, the Swiss Sinar had, uh, I had a couple German lenses with that, and uh, that's the old days, you know. And in fact, I wanted to show a few pictures of my darkroom. Um, and, you know, some years ago, I designed a darkroom for a, a major newspaper in the Chicago area. And I really enjoyed working with the photographers there. And we had multi-rooms. We had circular light-type doors. And uh, they really enjoyed it. Well, that building now is a dental office. So I don't know what they use for their darkroom because the, that uh, industry has really changed. And if, if you saw the article on August 1st in the St. Augustine record, uh, the photographer is a real photographer. Uh, P uh, Peter, uh, Michael, what? Willett. Willett. Peter Willett came to the house and uh, stayed for a while taking pictures and, and used one. But, um, but I had a nice talk with him about the old days and he said they used to have 130 uh, employees at the record and now they got six. Mm -hmm. That was amazing, uh, it's really changed. And a lot of the reporters use their camera phones to take the pictures. Um, so it's nice to talk to a guy who had his Nikon like, like I did, but here, uh, some years ago when I was uh, doing some restoration, renovation of uh, a school in Chicago, um, I was a young guy right out of school and 
the, uh, uh, the president of the firm uh, had his daughter working there for the summer and he decided that she could pick the colors for all the walls in the school. So she gets to the dark room and uses black on all the walls. And I said, no, you don't use black on the walls because you just gotta have uh, higher uh, wattage safe lights. And, uh, and a lot of the time in the dark room, you work in the light uh, doing your projects and doing uh, washing and cleaning and, and uh, drying. Um, but you can see way in the back is where my enlarger is, and that's dark back there. Maybe right around so you don't get reflections. But this is looking one direction. Looking the other directions, I had a custom sink made uh, so I could fit in the big pans to do some big prints. And I had some interesting projects at the time. I did all, a lot of color processing too. And I worked um, on architectural projects for the Dial Soap Company. Uh, this is off the wall here, but uh, they found out I did photography, so I started shooting soap. And, and I would smuggle no soap, secret soaps out of, the, that they were experimenting, these engineers in the soap business, uh, smuggle it out through the guardhouse and put it in my briefcase. They said, if, it, if you get caught, just have them call us, we'll, we'll release you. But um, anyway, I never got caught, and I had uh, was shooting soap um, that was uh, going to be, and some processing diagrams I was drawing. I had actually done a gallery, like a, a, an art gallery entrance to the building that uh, was a la Guggenheim, if you know it, it comes in and, and you have the artwork on the walls. Uh, because this was the time when the Americans with Disability Act was just being implemented and we wanted to bring it all up to code. Anyway, here's, here's my, uh, uh, my enlarger. You can see to the right over here is actually uh, the color head. This is a color analyzer. And I did a lot of color printing as well and a lot of slides for the engineers so they could use in their presentations as well. Those days are gone though. And, uh, but now I do digital work, and here's a few exhibits. I've had exhibits in many, many places, lots of libraries. Uh, one, here's one in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I had 70 photos on the wall here, but I had five display cases full of uh, artifacts and photographs. This is in my hometown of St. Charles, Illinois. There's actually two walls like this in this space, and this is in conjunction with the program I was doing on my uh, work in, uh, in Armenia, Amazing Armenia. Um, and I had exhibits uh, sponsored by a bank. I had, uh, I did all the interior photographs for uh, a family restaurant uh, that is now a, now a bar and grill. So those have all changed. They were all architectural pictures and details of, of, of historic detail, details of buildings. And also, um, I, after uh, my Peace Corps days, when I was coming home from Kosovo, that was my third assignment. I was in Ukraine from 2011 through 14. In 2015, I had a, a six-month short-term assignment as a response volunteer, it's called. Uh, and in 2016, I had a six-month uh, assignment in Kosovo. And I was coming home, and there was a coup in Turkey, so it messed up all the airports uh, in Eastern Europe. And I ended up in Zurich, Switzerland, which was very nice. Uh, <laughs> some people were really complaining about it, and especially since I had uh, a, a portable printer and two uh, laptops that were going through the uh, the scanner of the machine, and the guy behind me got all excited and said, we're gonna miss our plane. Well, we already did. Um, and the security came over and told them to calm down, otherwise they would have to deal with them. Anyways, an interesting experience um, to get a call then in Zurich to ask me to come out to Cheyenne, Wyoming, uh, to be the historic preservation architect for the Capitol building there. And I gotta say that uh, I got this itch for travel back when I was a student at the University of Illinois when I went to France uh, for uh, six months as a student and got to travel a lot and saw most of the countries um, and I always wanted to continue the travel. So um, as a member, I was appointed to the American Institute of Architects Historic Resources Committee, the, the perfect committee to be on if you want to travel. Uh, we had meetings three times a year at historic sites around the United States and sometimes in other uh, places like uh, in Bath, England. Uh, we had a meeting in Rome at the Vatican to meet with the architects there who were doing restoration work at the Vatican. And it was just a great thing. And I became their official photographer. Uh, I had an exhibit in Washington at the American Institute of Architects headquarters in, in the year 2000 that documented the, uh, the last decade of the 1900s uh, photography on the trips that we had gone on. Um, 
So uh, I, I really got interested in the Peace Corps, though, when I had traveled to, to France and wanted to graduate and go in the Peace Corps because my brother had joined the Peace Corps and he had gone to El Salvador, Jamaica for three years. He was a trainer for the Peace Corps in Puerto Rico and then he got a fellowship to work in uh, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation to help set up a community college there. <coughs> And I thought, this is great. Yeah, I mean, back then, in those days, though, we didn't have a lot of communication like today, even when I was in the Peace Corps. Now we did a lot of Skype calls to, to students back in the United States. And I would have my counterpart, the young lady, uh, talk to them about what it's like to live in, in Ukraine. Anyway, uh, I was all ready to join the Peace Corps after I graduated from fi my five-year program. And they had a draft lottery. So I got number one in the lottery. Oh, yeah. And I knew I had to do something. So I went into the Army and became, with my degree in architecture, of course, what they made me was a combat medic. That made a lot of sense. I do have a lot of pictures, though, from my Army days, too. And I worked in hospitals. So I was very pleased uh, to have, actually, after that experience, in six years of, uh, of, of the Army National Guard, working in hospitals. My favorite was in San Antonio. Uh, and then a little later, I got involved with the restoration of the Alamo there. That's a controversial issue right now, if you've been watching the news. But anyway, uh, it's uh, made me feel comfortable working on medical facilities. So I did a lot of dental work in my architectural practice, so to speak. So um, finally, uh, it got to be a, uh, a retirement plan to join the Peace Corps. And back in, uh, well, 90, 1961, Kennedy started the Peace Corps and earmarked it for recent graduates of college to go in. Young people, excited people, lots of enthusiasm. Well, later on, they decided that uh, in 1996 that they needed people with experience in different fields, and they called it the Crisis Corps, That's an offset of the Peace Corps. So the Crisis Corps went to uh, the results of tsunamis, uh, hurricanes like Katrina. I went to Katrina, but not in the, uh, I went with the National Trust for Historic Preservation to evaluate houses for reconstruction. But uh, finally in, in 2007, they decided to call it the response volunteers instead of the crisis core and to bring experience and often, most often, older uh, experienced people of different fields like, like architecture, uh, like uh, medicine, agriculture or teaching uh, to go into different areas when they were requested by various countries. But so the older volunteers bring experience to the Peace Corps. And, and, I, and don't get me wrong, I worked with some great enthusiastic young people, but the experience of the older people really made a difference in a lot of communities. <laughs> um, the other thing that the older people got was respect. You can clap for that one. Uh, but a lot of respect, and, and even with the young people. Once you get beyond the question that, why are you here? Why would you believe America and come to Ukraine? Are you a spy? <laughs> <laughs> well, you get beyond that by just working together with the people there. Um, so, we'll, we'll move on to, uh, just uh, the article in the paper was based on a press release out of Washington uh, for the Lillian Carter Award, and I was one of the top nominees for the award. And, and it was kind of fun. Unfortunately, it's usually at the Carter Library at near Atlanta, and uh, it was all by Zoom this time. So uh, uh, this is what you see. Here's the article. There's a copy of it on the table back there. Uh, but I started out in Ukraine, and uh, then I went. Uh, these are the two locations. The northern point is Cherniga, which is about 45 miles east of Chernobyl. That's why I have a glow about me. And, uh, and then I uh, went to Vinitsa, which was a little more central. Um, and after three years there, we were evacuated uh, because of the invasion by Russia and the devolution. I went to Armenia, and then over to Kosovo, and then on the Cheyenne, uh, Wyoming, I told you I was there for three years from 2016 to 19, working as architect at the Capitol building. That was quite an interesting cultural shock uh, and experience. And, and then it was on to uh, St. Augustine. And actually, I, I was here a lot when I was a kid because my grandmother, who's, uh, who was 100% my Norkin, uh, lived on Ocean Avenue by Our Lady of Olaychay Chapel. And uh, we used to sneak under the fence at the Fountain of Youth and don't tell John 
Frazier, who's the owner there, because uh, I owe him a couple of admissions. Um, actually, I already told him that. Um, but he says people still sneak under the fence, and I'm going to find that hole. Uh, and, you know, using photography as documentary work, and I, I do put it on automatic mostly, um, unless I've got a, a study thing. Like I, when I was shooting soap, I would want to get good depth of field and different uh, lighting and, and really work the shot a lot. But um, uh, when I was in different communities, I, I would uh, do a walking tour guide using my photographs. And these communities like Cheyenne didn't have anything like that. So now I got to tell you that, um, first of all, I worked with a couple writers uh, on a book called the, the History of the Wyoming Capital. And they even have my picture in there. So, but uh, several of my photographs are in it as well. But now they're working on a new book uh, called a history. I'm not exactly excited about the title, but a history lover's guide to Cheyenne, Wyoming. And uh, there's dozens of my photos that are going in this book. It's not actually out yet. This is just the cover they sent me. Um, but and I'm not supposed to show it to anybody, so don't tell. Uh, it's not out until October. Um, but also, I wrote the foreword to it. And the first thing I had to do is figure out, how do you spell forward? <laughs> really, that's a tough word when it's in a book. It's different from forward but going ahead. So anyway, that's. Uh, and actually, the walking tour guide, well, I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, led into a book that I did, too. Probably because your screen has the, see the white, you probably have to get out of that. I think you hit it accidentally. Now let's try. There we okay. go. Here's the, uh, the Capitol building, which is, uh, we worked with the, um, the governor and a, a um, steering committee, um, and they always called this the most important building in the state. Um, I think the railroad station that was built about the same time is pretty important, too, that otherwise people wouldn't have gone there. Uh, anyway, it was a great project, and we worked with some great artists uh, from around the country, even with sculpture work and with uh, wall stenciling. But it was a $317 million project, and I was going around the state with my PowerPoint presentation showing photographs, so I was documenting the building and, um, and, and the workers, uh, heroes of the Capitol, as I called it in an exhibit I did at the grand reopening. We had a, a hallway to uh, display the heroes of the Capitol, and the workers just loved it. And it's still up in a different location now, but it's still up in Cheyenne. Um, but we had some, some wonderful uh, workers uh, who were heroes of the Capitol. But you know, in Ukraine, it's really about the people, and, and in the Peace Corps, all the way through Armenia, and uh, been back to all the countries uh, that I've been to in the Peace Corps, Armenia, Kosovo, and Ukraine. And look at how s the people smile. They love to get their picture taken, too. Uh, I got into a little trouble in Armenia when I, uh, in my blog that I did every couple weeks, I would embellish it with photos, and I put a photo of the Russian army base. Uh, I was called into the country director's office and security, and they said, you can't do that. But uh, I went in the next day, all night I was worried about it, couldn't sleep, and then I went in the next day and I said, you know, I looked through the manual and it doesn't really have any guidelines because in Ukraine, the people loved it. You can see some, some of the military guys here and here a guy with his medals. Um, and, uh, of course, after World War II, they came home to medals. They didn't come home, they came home to disaster. Uh, and the medals were the only thing they, they really had to live for uh, in a lot of ways. But uh, here are the faces of Ukraine. <coughs> now I wanted to just show you, this is a symbol for Ukraine, this uh, logo for, this, uh, for the country, and it says Volia, which means freedom. Now it seems very conjectured to me to get that out of that symbol, but that's what they told me, it, that symbol means freedom. And yet, next Tuesday on the 24th, is the 30th anniversary of the freedom and independence for Ukraine. They'll have big celebrations, and I still get the Ukraine uh, key post. Uh, but th the attitude was something we dealt with in Ukraine um, of the Soviet legacy. And I'm not going to just read this uh, column, but it, it had to do with the pessimism and, and that we can't do that. And, and uh, you know, and we had uh, some of the people like uh, Maggie over here is actually. Uh, I met her in Ukraine, and she taught uh, resume writing, and people didn't 
promote themselves very well sometimes, and so she taught how to do that. Uh, but even some banning freedoms and, and things, they, the word that I heard all the time was takono i est. It is what it is. We can't do anything about it. Takono i est. And I heard that too many times. And then the revolution started, and they started doing something about it. Uh, this is actually Tatiana. And when I first got there, I was a little taken back and not too comfortable with, uh, we all had a host family, and my host family was a lady 10 years younger than me, Tatiana. And she showed me all around the city, she's showing me uh, the opera house here and St. Uh, Catherine's uh, Cathedral, which by the way, during Soviet times, couldn't be a church, they didn't allow religion. It became a uh, tapestry and, and weaving museum. Um, I wanted to show you a little closer, St. Catherine's, where uh, you see this tent down below. Well, one night that was in flames uh, because that tent was actually occupied by the Russian Orthodox people who said the church is theirs, and they called it the Ukrainian Orthodox. So the war uh, that is, is even going on now has a little bit to do with religion. And even when I was in Armenia, looking across the river to uh, Azerbaijan, recently they had a flare up in their uh, battles there. Uh, I asked one young man at the uh, World Vision uh, Foundation who I was visiting in this little town of Shambarak, Armenia, he pointed up to a hill and said, that's where they shoot us. Uh, and I, I got a little nervous, I guess. He said, don't worry, it's not during the day, it's only at night. <laughs> so he said, well, why do they shoot you? And he says, because they're Muslim and we're Christian. And I thought, that's not a very good reason. So anyway, it was an eye-opener. Uh, when I was in Chernigov, I actually uh, initiated a project for a small group of us to uh, make the Mercy and Kindness Child Development Center accessible. Because I was really into accessibility back in, um, even in the um, early 70s, I was working on the first uh, fully accessible new school in Illinois. And we didn't have the Americans with Disability Act yet, and I wrote a, a document called the Human Factors Analysis, which talked about uh, what we need to do with this building. I'm not sure why I call it that, um, but it's about the, how these people get around in the building and how we design it. And I discovered that the kids couldn't get around in this building. So I did this drawing, and I do all my drawings by hand. I've been accused of lying about that from some students who said, no, those are CAD drawings. Those aren't by hand. I guess they're tight drawings. Uh, but uh, I, I just, just simply designed a ramp. I designed a handicapped accessible toilet room. I let them get out to the play yard with a ramp. The kids had to be lifted up with the wheelchairs, and, and it just wasn't, it didn't make any sense. Just want to show you a little bit about uh, Ukraine, that it's uh, about the size of Texas, okay? Um, I'll get rid of that. And the flags on there, Ukrainian flags with the blue and yellow, were places I had been, maybe did a little work with other uh, Peace Corps uh, young people, a lot of them, with a lot of enthusiasm. And the, uh, these are the places I did actual projects in, like in Kersh. Uh, you can see Russia from there. Uh, now they have a bridge that goes across from Russia to Crimea that's 11 miles long that uh, can bring people right in. And one of the reasons the Russians wanted Crimea back is because it's a big vacation area. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, Vinitsa, the city I was in uh, most of the time uh, for the three years is right here. And up north, there's Chernobyl, but there's Chernikov. Um, and I worked in Lutz uh, as well, got a, a castle restoration there. And in eastern Ukraine, this is where the Russians had invaded. This is the, the war zone. And then, of course, Crimea is down here, which the Russians have claimed now. Very debatable. Um, you, you can uh, look at the uh, Khrushchev uh, apartments, the housing that was built when Khrushchev was in power in the 1960s, built as temporary housing for 20 years. Well, over 60 million people still live in these houses today. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my, my apartment is right here on the third floor. They would only go five stories because then they didn't have to put elevators in. I was just happy I was on the third floor and not the fifth floor. Um, but it's, it's interesting, I wanted to show you, um, you know, using photography is just a, a tool to show you the culture, and, uh, and that's what I did 
even there, when I would do programs about photography, for one, and about architecture in America. I used a lot of my own projects with different uh, restoration projects to show uh, the people American architecture, the student. But here's my apartment, and the foyer, bath, kitchen, uh, living and sleeping, it's one space, and the balcone, the balcony. Um, this sometimes was occupied, this kind of apartment, by three generations. The grandkids, the, the parents, and then the grandma, the babushka. Uh, and it's, it was fine for me, perfect for me. Uh, except you'll see there's no, not many closets. Here's a little closet here. But so some cabinets help out. And uh, the outside balcony really was the drying area for your laundry. <laughs> there was a little grinder type uh, laundry machine in there. And, and you know, people in Florida will appreciate this. This is the water heater. Uh, it has a porpoise on it. I, I have close-ups of that, of course. I, there was a journalist in Chicago who did a story about me. Um, and, uh, that, it, it's that article that, that is on the counter there. She asked how many photographs I took when I was in Ukraine. And I said, I it's over 10,000 because I have to pay for my, uh, my Picasa. That's what I still use, even though they don't have that anymore, um, through Google. And um, after 10,000 photos, you have to pay for it every month. Well, I said it's 15,000. Well, it's a lot, lot more than that. But you know, you take a lot of pictures and, and people don't see them, or maybe you think, I remember I took a picture, so you go back and grab it and, and bring it out. Uh, you can store them. And the good news and the bad news, uh, back when I started the uh, Picasso was in uh, 2011, when I was in Ukraine, so I paid 229 uh a month, okay? That was like about $14 a month back then. Now it's about $8 a month because the devaluation of the Dreven that has happened. So um, I worked a lot with the National Technical University. Um, I, I enjoyed working with uh, a professor who wrote this book about uh, domestic architecture, uh, the folk architecture in Ukraine, and I enjoyed that. Um, I remember uh, nobody's ever on time in Ukraine, and that drove me nuts because I don't think I, well, I was late to a meeting once because I got a speeding ticket, okay. But other than that, uh, the, um, I was trying not to be late. Uh, get to the meeting and the lady, uh, lady says, well, my, my husband's the head, uh, chief judge of the county. We'll take care of that for you. And I said, no, it's like $30. It's, it's okay. But um, anyway, I was going to this meeting. This was a, a meeting a conference on ecology and loading up things. I was going to do photographs there and the keynote speaker was call, had called on the phone when we were in the taxi cab and my counterparts talking to him and she hangs up the phone and looks at me and says, you know anything about ecology? Our keynote speaker can't make it today. Mm -hmm. So I was, I had about an hour to prepare. And it was kind of an interesting uh, experience because I talked about some earth sheltered houses that I had designed and I talked about the big problems they have in Ukraine where everybody leaves their windows open uh, in the winter uh, because there's no thermostats, it's all government controlled. Uh, and uh, then uh, I, I said, you need to vote for people who will change that. And, and one guy says, uh, Taka Ono yes. Oh, there it is again. <laughs> it is what it is. It's government control. And I said, you've got to vote and get the people in who will take, uh, make a difference there. Uh, because that is really a problem when you, it gets too hot in the apartments. And I had to do it too. You just couldn't do it. So uh, those of us. Uh, in the Peace Corps, always do English clubs. Uh, and I learned Russian when I was in Chernigo. Uh, in three months, you learn so much. But then when I got to my assignment, it was a Ukrainian-speaking city, about 380,000 people. And uh, people wanted to learn English. So I did uh, three English clubs a week, a Wednesday evening, a Saturday morning. But I did a, a Friday afternoon club, too, for uh, an IT group that wanted to learn English. You know, we talked about uh, things that they don't necessarily understand, like volunteerism or, uh, you know, different activities. I got myself into trouble too many times 
talking about how I grew up playing golf. I went to, uh, I was a, uh, cad uh, I was a caddy, went to college on a caddy scholarship. It was all about golf. Um, and they said, you must be filthy rich or a politician. <laughs> and I said, well, neither of those two. But um, we talked about, uh, you know, what do you, what do you do for sports and your leisure time? Oh, soccer. Oh, yeah, you're going to play soccer until maybe you're 35 and then your knees give out and you can't compete with the younger guys. Golf, you can play your whole life, you know, till the end. So it's a great sport and I wish I could teach it. But there's only two golf courses in all of Ukraine. One was owned by the president, Yanukovych, and the other was an independent private club. So here's that uh, IT group. Um, I got, I was, they heard about me, so they asked me if I could come to the office in the afternoon sometime, and I went on Friday afternoons. It was only a couple blocks down from my apartment, so it worked out real well. Um, they've got the typical uh, non-smile for Ukrainians for photographs. I'll show you more of that. It's kind of a, a Soviet thing. Um, here's another group, a window on America Center at the library in Vinitsa. Now, I showed this lady. She was the first handicapped person who came in to that library after we put in ramps. We got a little grant from a, uh, an organization in California called Water Charity. Water Charity uh, gave us money to upgrade the toilet rooms. I mean, it was a little stretch because they usually worked in Africa with uh, clarification of water and helping uh, poor countries. And I applied for a grant and we got it. And then the city was embarrassed and also the library board was embarrassed. They came up with more money, so we did the whole project. Um, and this was the first handicapped person who could make it to the second floor uh, and use the library. But you'll see there's a lot of photographs in these, and, and this is where I taught about photography as well and, and how it can enrich your, your life. This little girl I asked in a little village, asked her to do the peace sign, and I showed her what it was, and she had no clue what it was. So her father happened to be there, so she asked him what it was, and he knew. Uh, but uh, by the way, this lady over here, they told me she really liked me. So, uh, um, I'm the one in the middle here, <laughs> but uh, we have clowns at Special Olympics. This is Maggie Hankamp over here. She's sitting right here. She uh, was in Ukraine at that time as well. And this is Eugene, who is the director of social services, and he, he calls me the father of the Best Buddies program. Best Buddies was a program started by Anthony Schreiber. His father uh, started um, as the first uh, director of the Peace Corps in 1961, uh, Sergeant Shriver. And, and so we developed the Best Buddies program for Vinitsa, and now it's spread around the country, so I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, so Special Olympics was something that we got involved with. Uh, the ambassador uh, requested to come to Vinitsa, the town of 380,000, beautiful architecture, uh, and I was asked to be the tour guide, and that's how I started um, doing these uh, uh, walking tour guides, but I also developed this book. Uh, I it developed this through Shutterfly. Maybe some of you use Shutterfly. It, they did a very nice job for me. There's about 40 copies of these floating around Ukraine right now in the libraries there, and even in my library at home in Illinois. And uh, this photograph on the right I th these photographs were taken with my camera, but of course I'm in them. So I always had someone in the office who would take the photos with my camera. And actually a photo like this was on the cover of the local newspaper where they had a caption in Ukrainian that said, and the ambassador, John Teft, who eventually left and went to Russia as ambassador, uh, but John Teft walked down the streets unguarded. I don't think so. There's guns under those coats back there. Yeah. And also there were people stationed along the route. That's how I developed the walking tour guide because they wanted to know exactly where I was going and what route I was going to take. So I developed that into a walking tour guide. I thought, well, I've done the work already. I met with the security people the week before and developed this uh, tour guide. And then it developed into a book. Now, um, and, and John Teft actually, um, he sent me a very nice letter. It's framed over there on the table. But he said, you know, you're an, an ambassador uh, for the United States in Ukraine. You're out working with the people. You're, you're out uh, meeting people who have never have ever met an American before. And he's behind the walled uh, compound 
with guards. Uh, so we're out there every day. Um, but here's a, a statue of architect Gregory Artinov in the early 1900s, did a lot of the significant buildings in Ukraine. And, and I, when I was do, doing the tour, he said, we need a picture with you here because they need to do another statue of you with, with Art, uh, Artinov. I don't think they've done that yet. But this is one of Artinov's uh, buildings. It was a water tower, very elaborate. And you know what? It's now um, a museum uh, dedicated to the um, as an Afghan war memorial. Uh, 1979 to 1989 uh, was the span where the Soviet Union was actually in uh, <coughs> Afghanistan, and they got out in, in 89. So I don't want to talk politics, so I'm going to move on. But uh, that's an interesting thing that they knew enough to get out back then. They weren't going anywhere. But here's the book I was just showing you. Here's a copy back in the too. Yeah, and that was a lot of fun to do. And we got a lot of publicity. The uh, papers picked up on it. Had a big test press conference, met with the mayor. Um, and this is a page in the book where I did a diagram of Werewolf. Uh, werewolf is uh, actually uh, Hitler's farthest east um, encampment. And it actually is amazing that people don't know about the history in, in Ukraine. They suppress history. Um, they don't teach it in the schools much. And this is right on the edge of Vinitsa. Uh, and it was built to be five stories and onto the ground, underground. Of course, it was blown up when the Nazis left. Uh, and so it's, a, it's quite damaged now. This is the drawing I did for the book because I wanted to encourage people to go see this. And here's my friend Andre who uh, is a retired colonel in the Air Force in Ukraine. And he was the one who told me about it and said, you gotta see this, you, you won't believe it. And here's part of the, the construction that's blown up. And, and nobody's excavated, they're afraid there might be mines still underneath that they will uh, find by mistake. Uh, and some people think there are great treasures buried in there that they need to uncover for five stories. And not far away, less than a mile away, is this monument to the 14,000 workers who uh, were Ukrainian who worked there and then were ordered to be killed by Hitler at the end of the project. So they wouldn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's part of the history they don't really teach. Now, let's see what I can. Um, I don't know if I can do this. There's a little music here. just to give you a little flavor of the music there. <laughs> but uh, I enjoy that. I'd love, there's a, my favorite parts for the end. They were smiling. Yeah. Well, you see, they have the red front, and I have the blue. Yeah. This is inappropriate for Vinitsa, where I was living, but I, it goes with my eyes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I can't wear the red, <laughs> and, unless maybe uh, they're bloodshot. But, uh, anyway, and the, the ladies have just unbelievable outfits. It's been really fun to learn about the port folk culture, culture, and also the Paisanki. Uh, there's a few um, that are actually wood eggs back there. Uh, and, and this is in Kolomia in western Ukraine, um, and uh, near the Carpathian Mountains. They have the Paisanki Museum. This has over 10,000 Paisanki eggs in it. Uh, actually, this is the entrance. You go through this egg, and then it goes into the building behind it. And they're very proud of it. It's not just an Easter egg, by the way. It's all year round, it's a craft. Ah, there's Slava. And uh, actually I was showing this slide at a presentation at a library once and this lady just screamed out when she saw that picture. I don't know what she's talking about, but <laughs> Anyway, Slava uh, Varachuk actually is the singer for Oki and Elsie and went to a couple of his concerts, but uh, 
at the same time, around 2011, Amy Winehouse, I don't know if you've heard of her, mm -hmm. she was a British uh, singer, and she died of a drug overdose and alcoholism. And uh, it was like, what's that about? She had the world anywhere she wanted. And this guy has been uh, named a cultural ambassador to the UN by the president in Ukraine. And uh, he really does well. He's actually, his organization is funding some parks. These are drawings that I did of, of park design, some playgrounds. And uh, he was funding those for us. And, and it was wonderful to see him in concert. Um, and I did a lot of work in Severetica, Ukraine, small village. Uh, I'm not sure why I put that squirrel there. Get out of there. Uh, because there aren't very many in Ukraine. They ate them all, mostly, um, during the famine which was mostly 1932-33 uh, was the famine, the holodomer. Uh, but then there was a lot of atrocities going on with the Jewish people. There were several towns, small towns, that disappeared because the Jewish people had to leave or they would be killed. And I wanted to just point out one, uh, one book that a St. Augustine writer has written uh, in the last uh, year and a half and her name is Hera Ma Masi, and she actually spends part of her time in Massachusetts and then part of her time here in St. Augustine, but uh, this book is available at the local bookstores. And it's about, uh, it's written for kids, basically, but it's, a, it's part of a history that's not told to the Ukrainian kids, and so it really needs to be introduced into Ukraine. Uh, and they talk about the escape of a family and hiding out in the woods and hiding out in caves and, and it's the name is my real name is Hannah they changed their names so that wouldn't sound Hannah sounds too Jewish I think they thought as she talks about in here they had to change their names if they had to tell somebody their name they didn't want anything that might be confused that it might be Jewish at all so it's amazing you know that that would happen there um, there were like three and a half million Jewish people in Ukraine who died, uh, j not just on account of the Nazis. So anyway, you can take a look at that later if you'd like. But I enjoyed working in Severenica. This is a, a little theater that I designed, and uh, my language changed, and I don't mean from Russian to something else. When the uh, director of the regional development office I was working in took me out, I had done some concept drawings and this was under construction. Uh, here's the first audience here. And here are my drawings. They were very conceptual, and they were building it, so I said something like, holy crap, only it was different than that. And because I didn't expect them to build from a concept drawing. I needed to give them some dimensions, and some, I mean, it was all in scale. But here they are, here's the mayor out there with his grin on his face. And uh, so they asked me to do more work there in Severenica. Um, uh, including uh, uh, the concept for an open-air museum of folk architecture, which is popular in, uh, in Ukraine. There's a few of them. Um, and so I did uh, churches and this poster to promote it. And this is the, uh, the plan drawing that has the visitor center and different buildings that need to be in a, uh, this recovery of a culture to present the culture of Ukraine. And then I worked on a village square there as well. They do a lot of festivals, and they're beautiful, except that if it rains at all, it's all muddy. <coughs> so I proposed that you need a plaza, you need an outdoor uh, uh, theater in that area too. This is the village hall in Severenica. This is a cultural center, which is that, uh, very grand. And this is a school. And in between, they have booths all set up for the festival here. Uh, but they would do that just on the dirt. and. Uh, so I gave them a plan to uh, develop that into a nicer area. Here's some of the people at a festival. Now this is actually bread, mm -hmm. very tasty bread. And uh, here's Maggie again, who's sitting over here. Um, I actually got, uh, near, near St. Charles, Illinois is the Ball Seed Company. I don't know if you're a gardener, maybe you've heard of them, but uh, they have a beautiful, beautiful gardens. 
Uh, these are photos I took in their gardens. Um, and, um, and they donated a lot of uh, herbs and flower seeds so that in Severenica they could start this, uh, working at this gardener's cottage to develop gardens. Uh, they couldn't send them to Ukraine. So they said, well, we were happy to uh, give them to you, but I don't know how you're gonna get them there because you can't send them through the mail and whatever. So I just put them in my checked in luggage and then got through, so uh, don't tell anybody. Uh, not close to but we worked with a, uh, a Rotary Club. Um, I had to work with a local Rotary Club, so there's a connection there. Uh, and I, yeah, I'm a member of the Kiwanis Club here. I'm the secretary of the Kiwanis Club of uh, Historic St. Augustine. I've been a Kiwani in all my adult life, but there were no Kiwanis Clubs there. So I worked with Rotary. They're a little more international. And uh, I went to some of their meetings, a couple of their meetings, and I found out that they really don't have any projects. They don't know what volunteerism is. It's, it's like, they don't say, what are you doing that for, you know? Uh, well, we had to have a connection. They didn't have to come up with any money or anything because this, this club in uh, Lockport, Illinois was taking care of, and the president of the club at that time was a, uh, a former client of mine who worked at a museum. I did a lot of museum projects over the years. So anyway, the Podolian Agency for Regional Development, that's what was who I worked for in the meets at Ukraine and then with the, working with the village. But uh, we made a lot of people happy with their seeds. Uh, these are not my photos, and we qualify that. that uh, you know, you can be interviewed by the journalist there and, and say, you know, I'd like to use some of your photos. Uh, how do I get permission? They said, just use them. You're the best ambassador Ukraine has. That's what they told me. So I use them. I hope it's all right. But, uh, because I never went in the president's house. This is. Yanukovych and Putin, and they were good buddies. And I gotta tell you, I don't understand, uh, you know, Paul Manafort was Yanukovych, one of his uh, consultants, and worked for him. And uh, then he became, uh, and I don't wanna talk politics, but he became uh, the campaign chairman for Trump. And I thought, doesn't anybody know who this guy is, Paul Manafort? Well, then he went to jail and now he's been pardoned. But uh, anyway. Uh, here's the house. Actually, architecturally, the inside and the outside don't relate at all. Yeah. Don't you think so? It, it, that's the same house. It, it truly is. Um, but he had the golf course and, and a big car collection. And these, again, are deep post photos. This is the hotel that we like to stay in. It's the Hotel Ukraine, right at the Maidan. The Maidan, that just means square, but it's the name that you hear about the, uh, uh, where the, all the uh, revolution happened. These, again, are from the deep post. This is my photo from the hotel room at a, in a peaceful time. This is the Maidan. McDonald's is back there. Uh, but it was a very pleasant plaza and area uh, back here. Uh, and at night, it was beautiful. Here's another photo I took out of the window of the hotel room. Uh, but this one is a photo by one of the staff people. He said, we don't want you going there, so I'll give you photos to use. Uh, because we don't want you going to the to the revolution to take pictures. It's too dangerous. So he took this picture. Um, Marat. Uh, it's a Maidan. It's actually Independence Square. And again, a key post photo, but it's just too good to be true. Uh, I, I like this do not enter sign behind all the police there. Um, and uh, I talked about Oki and Elsie and Slava. Here's a... Yeah, just a little taste of his music. And it was very peaceful on the square and in the revolution until, until uh, the president Yanukovych started getting his uh, uh, Rakut, which were their sharpshooters and uh, <coughs> people who were poised on top of the buildings to shoot people in the, um, who were in the revolution. And by the way, I let, like this, this is my, my picture, but uh, it happened all over the country, in, including in Vinitsa too, but uh, I always wanted to run into one of these guys with the camouflage on to make sure he knows it's working. But <laughs> when I saw his expression, I didn't do that. <laughs> Uh, Vitaly Klitschko is actually a heavyweight boxing champion, but he also became mayor of 
Kyiv, he still is mayor of Kyiv now, but he was in contention to be president of Ukraine when Yanukovych left on February 21st, 2014. I know that because it's the same day I left and we evacuated. This is a photo I took of, uh, of uh, Poroshenko, who was actually president after uh, Yan Yanukovych left. And at this time, I'd like to do the raffle because you see this Roshan in there? He was an oligarch who owns the chocolate company. So uh -huh. if we could do that, Michael. There's a couple of people maybe who didn't get the tickets. I'm not sharing. But you guys are okay. We're gonna. I'm going to give out the first one, and then whoever gets the second, third, and fourth, we have four of them, can go in the back. And, and there's the picture I took of, of uh, Poroshenko, and he says on it, Priviet, or hello, uh, try my chocolates. <laughs> and everybody has one in? All right. Last three. Zero, zero, seven, double, oh, seven. That's a lucky number. There we go, Sarah. Hey. 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 Right, you want to do the rest fine? Yeah, let's do the three. Okay. All right. Zero seven nine. Where's yours? That's right there. Oh, yeah. That's the one I need to check. We got to verify this. <laughs> you know, I've, there's Mike's very honest. That's I, what I, I heard. Mike's very honest. <laughs> <laughs> Mike's very honest. <laughs> <laughs> and Mike is the one who said that he didn't want to do it. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Okay. All right, good job, Mike. All right. Sure. A couple more things I just want to talk about. <laughs> okay, actually the, the revolution did come to my city of Vinitsa, and this is the government building, which is uh, the state government. Uh, they're called an oblast in, uh, in Ukraine as a state name. And my office was in this building. Um, but it was run over by uh, the revolutionaries who took over the lobby and, and, and they were trying to be nice about it. Uh, but again, you know, they, they looked a little rough. This, there was a law that was passed by the uh, legislature that uh, you couldn't wear uh, any helmets. So a lot of the people came out, and here's a lady, and, um, and not a real lady, wearing a kitchen pot. <laughs> because they, the law didn't say you couldn't wear a kitchen pot on your head. Um, but the problem was that a lot of these guys who were in the revolution had even shields that were made out of plywood. Well, that didn't do a lot of good. In fact, on the Maidan, there, they uh, had some uh, 100 people one day died, and that was the time we left. Uh, and what year was this? Uh, that was 2014 in February. It started in the fall in 2013. But uh, this is the entrance to the, um, the office building where my office was. But uh, I was taking pictures and a friend from the uh, English club came by and he said, I'll take your picture. So here I am in front of it. And it says, fewer words, more action. And here's some of the hard hats, very creative, very creative people. And uh, here's my friend Andre. He's the retired colonel from the Air Force. Uh, and he's got it. He, that was his collection of hats he was passing out. And again, it's about the people um, yeah, in Ukraine um, and all the faces. Here's he's prime minister now, but he was the uh, uh, the mayor of the city 
Uh, I got into a little trouble here. Uh, a journalist did an article about me uh, when I extended my service. It's normally a two-year service, and I extended another year. Um, and it says here that American architect uh, wants to stay in Vinitsa, not Chicago. Well, I always said I was from Chicago because it's easier than St. St. Charles, Illinois, which I'm close by, etc. But uh, the real problem with this article, uh, it generated this cartoon because it got so many comments when I was quoted incorrectly when I was asked what I think about Soviet architecture, and I said, you need to respect it as a product of its time. And if you know a little bit about Soviet architecture, it's brutalism. It's a brutal force. Um, and, and so I said, you need to respect it as a product of your assignment. I'm trying to be politically correct. Well, it comes out that I love Soviet architecture. <laughs> so there were all kinds of, on, online, they got 284 uh, uh, messages one, in one day. And that night, I was up really late translating everyone to see what everybody was saying. It was my, <laughs> my 50 minutes of fame, but it took hours. Um, and this is the cartoon. That's me, and that's my son, supposedly, doing sandcastles, except he's doing Brutalistic architecture, and I'm saying to him, Ah, oh, son, Molodets are excellent. You'll be a great architect like your poppy someday. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, uh, the principal of our uh, regional development organization was a little upset about that, as you can imagine. So he demanded another article, which they did do, that he proofread and re read before it would go in the paper. He had that much power. Well, he was former KGB agent. Um, and, and Crimea, I spent a little time in Crimea towards the end before it was, uh, just a few weeks before it was taken over by Russia. I wanted to point this out. That's the car that we drove down there in. This is a monument right on the, the uh, Kersh Street there. Um, and some of the soldiers, and here I am, uh, had my, my friend Blakely took this picture because I wanted a sense of scale, and he said, you get in it, and I think. But this is where people would go underground during the World War II to get uh, safe. Uh, it, it's quite a hollow in the ground. Uh, and this is a fort that was built uh, on the Kirsch Strait. My friend Christine, who had actually invited me to go down and talk with the students and teachers down there. And here's our guide who, they weren't doing regular tours, but he uh, heard about it and said, you'll take these Americans on the tour of the fort. And he's pointing across where the bridge is now, actually over to Russia. Um, and here's some students that I worked with there, and I asked them, uh, again, it was one of those questions, uh, don't, aren't you worried about the Russians coming in because they're coming up the coast from Sushi, uh, where they had the Olympics, and they were all moving towards uh, Crimea. And, 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 and of course they said, uh, taco no yes, which is what it is. <laughs> so then it became Crimea, Russia. But you know, I wanted to show you this check. Um, it's a check for $7.2 million written in 1867 for the United States to buy Alaska. And our tour guide was telling us that it cost $7.2 million to build this fort in 1867. And I said, wait a minute, I think that's about the same amount as uh, the money you got from Al for Alaska. He says, I, I won't comment on that. <laughs> and here's uh, Viktor Yanukovych, and he faded away. Uh, uh, Pedro Poroshenko. This is a photo I took. Yeah, I wanted to fix his collar, but I couldn't. Maybe we can do that in Photoshop. <laughs> um, but uh, he has his uh, Ukrainian blue colors on. Uh, and uh, he became president. Uh, and this is the prime minister, the mayor of uh, Vinitsa. <coughs> And that was uh, May 25th, 2014. And here I am with the mayor when I'm presenting my book to him and my interpreter with me to help me out with the translation. Uh, but then we got this notice uh, that we were leaving overnight. Uh, we had to get out because the Russians were invading. And uh, we, uh, 11 of us met in Malilip Pavilsky, a little village. We were told to be inconspicuous. How do you go to a little village of 11 Americans and be inconspicuous? Anyway, we had to go all the way around this trans and Easter region uh, to get to the capital city, uh, Chisinau, so we could take any plane to go anywhere in the United States eventually. We did end up in Detroit. Somebody said that's another war zone. <laughs> but uh, here's our group uh, being inconspicuous at dinner in a restaurant. Uh, a lot of people wanted their pictures with us. 
because in the little villages like that, they don't uh, have Americans. Keep coming. Uh, here's one as a casualty that we had. Uh, Karis here had actually jumped uh, and gave him a big hug, and they fell against <coughs> the wall. And you know, so uh, as an old combat medic, I told you I could picture it. Um, and we're so we're in Moldova, but we needed to still be inconspicuous, so we put masks on. Not really. And here are some of the people. The people here. This is my uh, counterpart, uh, a translator and, and counterpart as well. Here's Oleg, the principal of the regional development organization. Of course, he looks like he could be a KGB agent, but he was. Actually, and my friend Eugene. Uh, and I returned to Ukraine. We returned back in September of 2014. And I wanted to show this picture. This Parashashenko is their national poet. And this is new. Uh, within a few months, they had this uh, out there, uh, you know, bringing the culture. To the, and here's the hammer and sickle that's on the bridge. And, uh, and when we, this is a picture I took before leaving. And then when I got back in September 2014, it had the Ukrainian symbol on it. Mm -hmm. It changed it out of the So, and from, the, again, the Hotel Ukraine to the Maidan, uh, here's, uh, mural on this burned out building it got highly damaged and it just says uh, a tribute to the heroes of the Maidan and all along the roadway between that building and the and the Hotel Ukraine is a monument of these figures who died in the heavenly hundreds they call them in the shootout on the Maidan and again it's it's about the people the culture the architecture and the hospitality were my favorite things it's all about the people and some of the uh, they love to get their pictures taken thank so thank you very much thank you I think you came thank you. Thank you. Thank you. so Mike what's uh, what's next for you well actually I'm uh, I'm retired what, what is that <laughs> I, I'm working on the Lincolnville Museum uh, as a project for, uh, we got a $500,000 grant from the National Park Service. It's a civil rights museum. If you haven't been there, you should go check it out. I'm also helping pro bono uh, Fort Mose. Um, if they heard about me working on the uh, Lincolnville Museum, which is the old Excelsior High School. Uh, it's a renovation project. It's actually in for building permit right now. And I happen to be uh, chairman of the Corio Review Committee for the city of St. Augustine. Uh, we review um, San Marco, anything to be constructed on San Marco, King Street, or um, Anastasia Boulevard. And I'm secretary of the Kiwanis Club. Uh, and uh, so I don't have time to think about what's next. <laughs> I keep, keep busy. I don't know what retirement is, but I. It, Keep busy and it's really enjoyable to have mm -hmm. yeah, things to do. Well, I'm curious with, with the art, with the review. Um, I've always wondered about that hotel they're building. Yeah. Um, Me too. I, yeah. I mean, what were they required to try to, for lack of a better word, make it look good? No, you know, um, I. You know, my I'm personal opinion. Large first of all, that that's the, I've only been this past year. Uh, the chairman of this review committee. They reinitiated re this committee. It wasn't in place with that uh, project. You're talking about the one across from the Ripley's, believe mm -hmm. it or not. Yeah. Which, hotel? Which hotel are you talking about? It's, it's across Renaissance. from the Ripley's, believe it or not. Right? I, I think it may be a renaissance, but it's very large, but yeah. instead of being a cubic monstrosity like I expected, it's at least has oh, some. Okay. I know what it's about. Yeah, I know well, anyway, I just for my opinion on that, I, I think it's uh, atrocious, uh, and I'll say that honestly that uh, it's a replica of what probably was never there. Uh, there was a hotel in that vicinity at one time, but it's not the replica of that hotel. I mean, that you might give a little bit of okay, uh, but I've seen visitors standing in front of that building now since it's pretty much finished. They're doing landscaping getting their pictures taken, doing selfies and all kinds of things in front of that hotel. Yeah. And I mean, or whatever it is. And, and it's not uh, St. Augustine. This is the one across the street from the visitor center? Yeah. 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 To the north. Yeah, to the, yeah, to the north of the visitor center. Right. 
I, I think it looks great. My wife thinks it's horrible. Yeah. Well, it's, it's an opinion thing, um, certainly. But uh, in fact, in my hometown in St. Charles, Illinois, uh, they had a mid-century modern building that they asked me to sit in on a couple of months' meetings uh, because people don't understand that. I did the historic uh, district report uh, survey back in, in the late 1980s, and I marked that building on the river, a beautiful river town, uh, as being non-contributing to the Victorian historic district. Yeah. Well, now you got to rewrite history because you're 30 years later uh, or more, and uh, you need to rewrite that and, and revisit every 20 years or so a survey like that uh, because now we're rewriting history and it was built in the 1960s as a mid-century modern building that's part of history. And it's a significant architect in town. But a developer has come in and, and it was a bank building and he's going to do a restaurant, which is a great idea, on the first floor on the river. Second floor, he's putting apartments, and then he wants to poke all these balconies out all over the place, which is inappropriate for that particular style. So anyway, I, I get in trouble telling my opinion, but it's a product of its time. That's what I say. <laughs> I use it a lot. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we'll take a break and we'll, uh, we'll work on the critique uh, submissions quickly. Uh, but thank you, Mark. Very interesting. Thank you.